Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on root cause healing and oftentimes I start with the carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. Okay, so today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Bruce Hoffman. Dr. Bruce Hoffman focuses on so many things and he really tries to get people that are suffering with chronic illness to root cause healing and truly heal people to a place that they could have a better life. As you listen to this conversation, you'll see that it gets very complex. There are layers of healing and he is not somebody that will sugarcoat things in a sense of you just need to do this and therefore you will heal, or you need to do that, or you need to take this magic pill. It's not like that for him. And he's just very real in terms of chronic illness is difficult. Chronic illness can cost a lot. Um, it can take a lot of effort and time and energy, but The point is that he says that there is hope and that you can heal, but there are certain things that you just need to go through and it takes time and diligence and the fortitude to want to heal. Sometimes it's working on our mental health and working on traumas from our past or even limbic system retraining and focusing our brains to not be as heightened in a immune response or a fight or flight. And it could even be deeper than that and working on somatic retraining. I will put a lot of the stuff in the show notes, but this is a very important conversation, especially if you're dealing with chronic illness, you've been to so many different doctors, you've done so many different modalities, tried different diets, and nothing is fully working to get you better. I talk a lot about SIRS as I spoke with Dr. Eric Dorniger, and we continued from that conversation to talk about little nuances about some of the medication, as well as how it combines with limbic system retraining and other things. What I want you to really get out of this conversation is to understand that healing is very comprehensive, but if you want it enough, and if you try enough and you do these things, that there is a way to get to root cause healing. I know that sometimes it may seem like our lot in life where illness is just prevalent, but it may sometimes be that we need to focus on healing our past traumas as well as even the way that we are viewing the world. As Dr. Hoffman brought up, we often think about 60,000 thoughts in one day. How many of those thoughts are actually making you sick or unwell or in a negative state that's then bringing that into your life instead of healing and the belief that you can actually heal? So while this conversation isn't the easiest, I think it's the most real and most open and genuine that you will find in terms of really trying to heal chronic illness so that you can have a better chance at optimal health. Dr. Bruce Hoffman is board certified and he has a fellowship in anti-aging medicine as well as a master's degree in clinical nutrition. He's a certified functional medicine practitioner and in his clinical training, Dr. Hoffman has also studied with many of the leading mind, body and spiritual healers of our times, including Deepak Chopra, Paulo, Osha, Ramesh Balsakar and John Kabat-Zinn. Dr. Hoffman was born and educated in South Africa and obtained his medical degree from the University of Cape Town. As you'll see in our interview, Dr. Hoffman is a lifelong learner. He is always wanting to learn and grow and learn from other practitioners and just provide the best level of care to get people to healing with his patients. I've met many functional doctors and naturopaths and integrative doctors that really try to consider the body as a whole, but Dr. Hoffman truly takes it to a whole different level. And that was one reason why I wanted to interview him because I felt that he can provide more answers for some of the hardest cases that we may find in the carnivore community. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Bruce Hoffman. I am so excited to have you on my channel. I heard a lecture of yours and I was enamored because you were able to consider all different illnesses and understand that the body is really one body and how so many things are affected. And you talked about how chronic illness is just more than one thing and how everything is connected. So um, I really wanted to have you on my channel. I think so many people will benefit from your knowledge. I loved also that you knew about the carnivore diet. So that was a bigger plus to me, but if you can introduce yourself. Oh, sure. So I am a South African trained MD. Um, graduated from the University of Cape Town where the first heart transplant was done. 
and uh, moved to Canada in 86 mm. and first was a rural physician and then started to be influenced and started to investigate all forms of healing. Um, having been originally exposed to Eastern philosophies and religions as a, as a teenager by my high school teacher, Roger. And so when I found myself in medical school, and then when I started to become a family physician, I started to visit some of the ancient healing practices that I'd investigated as a teenager and some of the philosophies. And then all of a sudden fell across Larry Darcy and Deepak Chopra and all the leaders in the field and went and met them and studied with them and then just kept expanding my diagnostic paradigm and therapeutic paradigm wider and wider to incorporate as many levels and layers of the human experience as I could and then fell into Ken Wilber's integral theory of everything and once you start you know, and once you start looking at external and internal and, and individual and cultural and you just start looking at all the determinants of illness you end up with a very large roadmap if you will and I eventually ended up taking the um, Ayurvedic roadmap of the, the, the koshas, the bodies that people seem to have. So if you look at the ancient Vedantic texts, they say, we're not just a physical body. We're, we're a physical body that's constantly in exchange with the external environment. So we're always exchanging atoms, you know, right. as Deepak likes to say, we've got, you know, a million atoms of Attila the Hun in us. Jesus Christ and Hitler, you know, we're constantly exchanging information. So, so the first level of the, of the paradigm I use is the external world of air and, and water and earth. And that incorporates all the toxicology because we're in touch with that and it, it interfaces with our second level, which is our physicality, our biochemistry and our structure. And that's what we do in traditional medicine and functional medicine and chiropractic and, and all the therapies that to, to do with structure and, and biochemistry. And then the third level is to, do, you know, to do with the um, energetics, the electromagnetic fields, as we've learned from, Carl, uh, from Albert Popper and, and others that our uh, light emits from our body in a coherent form from DNA. So DNA squeezes light and it emits, and there's a standing wave around us which is either coherent or incoherent. And it also resonates with human resonance, which is the sort of resonance of the earth. But then you've got all the man-made fields that are interposed upon it now. And then you have this dysregulation of the, our own innate coherent electromagnetic fields. And that's correlated with the brain and the autonomic nervous system. So I have a brain treatment center where I do QEEGs and we do heart rate variability studies and stress response testing. And that's the sort of the brain and the autonomic nervous system is the, is the sort of gateway between our internal experiences and our external world. It all eventually comes through the brain. The brain sort of records everything that our internal dialogue, our 60,000 thoughts a day, right. our values, our perceptions are all run through the system. And we know that our thoughts and beliefs influence our biochemistry and our immunology and our cell receptors. So the fourth level is the emotional body. So trauma plays a big role in that, as we know. And this is very real. Uh, people with early developmental trauma, attachment disorders, either neglect trauma or abuse trauma or disorganized attachment, they have much higher um, negative sort of health outcomes. And they have a much more difficulty in self-regulation. And self-regulation in the parasympathetic state is, is the healing state. And if these and if these individuals with you know early separation from mother or early neglect trauma, if they don't develop a sense of self, they don't have an ability to self-regulate. And that sets the so-called HPA axis in this heightened state of of hypervigilance and inability to self-regulate, which then shuts down the vagal tone and so forth and so on. So that's le fourth level is the emotional level. And then the fifth is the ego-based, the part of our, our reality that sort of gets us through life. Mm -hmm. you know, our ego-based um, ability to negotiate the slings and arrows of life is based on the resilience or the fragility of our ego self, which is very much the first half of life drivers. You know, we are driven in the first half of life by the ego to be a, 
you know, find safety with mother and father, find connection with other, and then find our way in the professional world, which is the three stages of development of the brain, you know, the reptilian brain, the limbic brain, the prefrontal cortex, we are driven to develop that, you know, neurodevelopmentally, so that in our 30s, we've now got a nice prefrontal cortex that can inhibit any fears or any uh, trust issues we have from early developmental support or not. Uh, so that's all to do with the with the fifth level, which is the which is the egos, the ego drives, and our defenses. When life gets too difficult, we develop defenses against certain things, right. and people have very sometimes very rigid defenses or very fragile defenses, and are often not open or susceptible to the healing movement. They just, they defend it against any further intrusion into their sacred innocence, you know, they'll protect you. And right. so you'll launch into a, a mold diagnosis, you'll launch into a Marcel and Lyme and whatever you want. You'll be working at level two with toxicology and physicality. But if that person's unconscious belief system is shutting out and defending them against any sensitivity or any vulnerability, you can work until the you know, the cows come home, you're not going to penetrate that, that system, that person. And you've got to be subtly aware of defense structures, internal dialogue, value systems. You've got to know those subtleties, I think, in order to best help that person. Because if a person's sitting in front of you and they don't trust you, you can work till, you can run <laughs> test till the cows come home. <laughs> Nothing's going to shift in that system. Well, the sixth level is the soul, um, second half of life, the, the authentic self that we often leave behind in the first half of life pursuits. You know, we go out and find safety and companionship and educate and safety and we slay the dragons, <laughs> the drives, the, the Freudian drives, right. you know, the bitterness drives, the Adlerian drives to power. But Carl Jung came along and said, the, the real drive is to know yourself. And that only sort of starts to surface in the in the second half of life when all the machinations and twisting of your psyche to get your needs met in the first half of life, you leave your authentic self behind in order to get seen and met and, and to get educated. But then in the second half of life, you got to go and reclaim all the parts you left behind right. in order to get where you were going. So that's soul driven. And the soul is personal and collective. Uh, and families, the family soul. We now know from early, you know, family tr constellation work that is initiated by Bert Hellinger and, uh, and and taught by others, including Mark Wolin, uh, who does fantastic work in this area. That we, when we're born, we not only get exposed to our parental influences, which have a, the whole set of determinants in the fourth level, but we also inherit um, epigenetically the experiences and emotions of our ancestors. And so you've got to like diagnose and treat ancestral inheritance of early experiences. And that's another whole subset that we look at. And in Jungian psychotherapy, we look at the individual soul. What is, what, what is the most authentic and instinctual core of this human being that's sitting in front of you? What is being asked to manifest? Because symptoms, as I've said in other webinars, symptoms are not, they don't fall out of the sky, you know? They, they're teleological, they have meaning and intent. And sometimes symptoms, whatever's silent in the system, in, in your psyche, will often show up as some form of illness or tragedy or bankruptcy or betrayal or whatever you want. And symptoms are like that. They, they're often pointing to that which is unseen mm -hmm. in your evolution. So if you lose symptoms as just things to get rid of, you know, suppress the mast cell response, you know, um, as opposed to why are the mast cells active? Is it because the child was never safe with mother? So she, they developed mast cell activation as a means to, to keep people at a distance with the skin rashes and the eczema. I'm not worthy of being touched, so I will keep my defenses. So symptoms can be teleological in that way. And if you don't ask that question, you often miss the boat. And then the seventh level is everything beyond uh, ego-based pursuits, you know, we, in the infinite universe, the, the uh, evidence for our insignificance is rather overwhelming. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and so sometimes we have to sort of give up our hubris and arrogance and, and know that in the vast scheme of things, just give thanks because we really don't know what's going on. You know, there's something, there's some divine intelligence that's manifesting that we need to be humble to, you know. I, I love that. And so I'm sure the people that are listening, it's, it makes sense. A lot of what you said, it's, it's really everything that we have experienced, but it's also a lot of what we don't know. And, and 
it includes the brain, it includes mindset, it, it could include religion, and even just ancestrally, a lot of the things as well. The question becomes then, I mean, we or Western medicine is all about, like you said, it's you have a symptom, it's how do you alleviate that symptom? Yeah, symptom. Yeah. And most of the people listening to this and watching this know that that's not good enough, right? We need to figure out why do I have pain so that I don't have to take that anti-inflammatory medication. But yeah. beyond that, then we go to naturopaths and functional doctors, and they say, it's an autoimmune or it's thyroid related. And again, it's treating a certain thing without considering all of the things that you just mentioned. Yeah. So if we are, for example, struggling with chronic fatigue, how do we start? Like where, where do we journey and how do we start getting to root cause? Because most people that are consuming this information understand we do need to get to root cause, but yeah. it gets confusing of, do I need to treat the limbic system first? Do I need to get out of the environment that um, I'm struggling with mold? You know, where do I start? Because I really just want to heal and I don't want to waste my money in this journey. But from everything you said, it's it's complex. complex yeah. <laughs> it's complicated. So I, I can only tell you what I do. I don't know if this is correct. I don't, you know, it just works most of the time with people. I'm sitting in my office here and three feet from me is where patients sit or six feet and I take history. So I, you know, I have a methodology of doing that. So I have a 70 page questionnaire and I ask and I read everything on that and I take the history from that. And my question is, like, is set up so I can quickly go through what I do is ask, first of all, what are your top symptoms? And I write them all down and I go through fatigue, cognition, sleep, dentistry, and then all the systems. And then I look at hormonal issues of male, female diet, um, psychological development, uh, family systems, uh, spiritual practices. So I go through all of those and I, I try and do it as quickly as I can it takes two to two and a half hours to take a history and then what but the thing is to attune to all the un, unsaid cues you got to you got to you got to limbically relate with the individual in front of you and you got to look for hidden cues and symptoms because it's not just knowledge you know it's yeah. it's, it's it's limbic resonance. It's it's you can't only use your thinking function. You got to use your feeling function as well. If you look at the Myers Briggs typologies, and so you take this history, you feel into it, but you also use left brain didactic reasoning. And then once you've taken a history across all the layers and levels, you then got to diagnostically work out where what do I need in order to help fill in the gaps of knowledge that this patient uh, needs in order to diagnose potential, as we use the words, antecedents, mediators, and triggers. And then I usually set out a whole series of labs, but I can tell you what I use more, more often than not. Um, I almost always do a QEEG. I look at the different speeds of the brain, the delta, theta, alpha and beta brain waves, and I look to see if they're amplified or depressed and the ratios between them. I look at the autonomic nervous system through heart rate variability. I do bioimpedance studies looking at fat, muscle, uh, fluid content. Um, look at the phase angle to see if the cell membrane is intact. Then we always do, never forget this piece, always, always. Like if, if there's one thing I'm passionate about is this one. Always do the NASA lean test, the 10 minute lying and standing test. Oh, okay. Because I tell you, 20 percent of people have pots right, right. Get really dizzy. And, and and you won't treat anybody with, unless you get the pots under control oh, there's no way yeah, yeah yeah so do the lean you know do that test uh, my staff are trained to do it on everybody and we train patients to do it at home mm -hmm. and so many have pots uh, yeah i also do a neuroquant mri mm -hmm. we're looking at different parts of the brain uh, we pixelate different frontal lobes, you know, temporal lobes, looking at the chordate nucleus, gray matter, white matter, and looking at the amygdala, because you'll see amygdala hypertrophy from traumatized people who are highly stressed and anxious. And also look at the thalamus, because the thalamus is richly innovated with mast cells, is rich with mast cells. And, and so we look at these different parameters. Then I do all the sort of functional, I do standard labs, everything I could possibly get my hands on that hasn't been done before. And you'll often find all sorts of things, you know, find thyroid antibodies that nobody's looked at before, or you'll find, you know, TSH levels that are sort of suboptimal with a low T3, which if you just tweak that 
things improve. You'll find prolactinomas. You'll find, you know, pituitary microadenomas. You know, you'll find these things if you really keep your diagnostic net quite wide. I always do a Panorex dental x-ray and then get a 3D cone beam and get a dental opinion on everybody. If somebody's had a head injury, I always get a nuca chiropractic assessment of C1, C2. And if there's any suggestion of craniocervical instability, I send people off to that group of people who specialize in that, like Dr. Bolognese and others. And then on the functional side, I do food sensitivities, not just IgG, but IgG, IgA, okay. IgE, and I do the lymphocyte sensitivity test as well. Oh, wow. And I look at the trends in it. I don't look at one. T- People come with the IgG4 test. It's, it's, it's hopeless, you know. So I look at all of those. I do many stool tests. I do the GI maps. Mm-hmm. I do the Genova stool test. I do the Dunwoody or Precision Lab, Zonulin, Histiaeo, um, histamine levels, and the lipopolysaccharides. I do that. I do the Entro Lab test if I suspect any gluten issues, looking not only for the, the genes, but looking for uh, tissue transglutaminase antibodies and fecal fat malabsorption. Mm-hmm. I also do um, SIBO testing on half my patients, because most of them, a huge majority, if they have a history of bloating, uh, SIBO is always a role. But there's SIBO, there's CIFO, now I've coined the term LIBO, large bowel bacterial overgrowth, LIFO, I, these are the words we use, you know, you've got to treat them all. And then you look at vagal tone, the whole motility issue, and that's through heart rate variability and specific devices we use. Then I look at the, I use the ion panel. I know some people use the uh, Nutravel, but I, the ion panel I can read in 15 seconds. I just, and look at amino acids, minerals, antioxidants, fatty acids. But for fatty acids, I mostly look at the Kennedy Krieger body bio fatty acid panel for omega 3, 6 distribution, saturated fat distribution, the ratios between them all, and look to see if the lipid content of the cell membrane is high or low. Because if the lipid content is low, like minus 25, minus 30, and you go put people on binders for mold, you're going to crash that patient like instantly. And so I look at that. I look at fats. Uh, we look at the organic, the oats, the part of the ion panel. I do oats testing. I do the Great Plains oats, heavy metals, and the mycotoxin test. But I, I'm really moving away from the mycotoxin testing because there's so much bad medicine being practiced with that test. It's, it's, I think it's, uh, I think Richie Shoemaker for all of his, you know, he's, he's, he's got some certain opinions about things. And one of the opinions he has is on the mycotoxin test, not being indicative of SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And on that, he's incredibly correct. You cannot go and diagnose mold illness based on a urine mycotoxin testing. Don't even begin to tell me you can, you know, you can't. And it's, it's bad medicine. And I wish it would stop, you know. Yeah, I learned that too, because essentially, if you're healthy, you will be able to remove mycotoxins from even your diet um, in a urine test. So you can't differentiate between a healthy person that's releasing versus somebody that's really poisoned from it. And so you need more markers than that. What's interesting is I'll find some SIRS clients that will then take the mycotoxin test and they're not releasing any because I think they're unwell. And so that part of it is interesting, but you're right. The test itself is not enough. But Well, they've, they've done testing with healthy controls and the healthy controls have the same mycotoxins in yeah. the urine because they had corn and uh, pizza the night before. Yeah. Right. You know, if I was your patient and I didn't have all the funds to do all that testing, is there a baseline you can start with? with based on my symptoms, maybe running some of the lab tests, maybe not all of those, because that's a lot. Well, I haven't finished yet. (laughs) (laughs) Let let me tell you that. Let me tell you the test that I really rely on now. Okay. That's the IGL test out of Germany. That test has changed my practice because that measures the adducts that sit on DNA affecting DNA transcription. And you can find mold and mercury and aluminum and glyphosate affecting how messenger RNA is transcribed. It also tells you about cell membrane voltage. It tells you about mitochondrial numbers. Because when you have what's called a cell danger response, mitochondria undergo autophagy and die. And you can measure the, how many mitochondria there are. And you can see it's low or not. You can see if the cell membrane voltage is low. You can then look at superoxide dismutase and glutathione levels. You can look at phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidyl ethylalanine, the outer and inner membrane of the cell. 
and you can see how depleted they are. You look at cardiolipin synthase and whether that enzyme is making cardiolipin and on and on and on. It's just a fantastic test. It also tells you about, it gives you a lymphocyte sensitivity test to mold fungal elements and metabolites. So you can see if mold is sitting on the DNA or whether there's fungal metabolites or fungal spores in the bloodstream to which the lymphocytes are sensitive. So I find that very helpful. Now, you'll often find people with a mycotoxin test in the urine that's negative. But when you go and look at the DNA, there's mold micro, mold spores sitting on the DNA affecting you know, um, transcription. Wow of messenger RNA. And that person is often far sicker than the one who's got mycotoxins in the urine is excreting them. Right. So you, in answer to your question, what tests you run and how do I do it? Well, I've got to the stage in my career where they everybody who comes to see me now, the peers, has done lots of these things, you know, but never, never enough. And so I say, look, here's what I need. Here's the tests. I also do Cyrex antibody testing. I do the neural Zuma antibodies to brain, you know, I, uh, I do all the Almond Lab, mole, uh, Lyme testing and Igenex if I have to. So I say, here's what I need to complete your diagnostic profile. And my staff then send it to them. And then it's their decision with their budgetary restrictions. I try not to interfere with that because some people have funds, some people don't. If they don't have funds, I then try and adjust my practice accordingly. But then you've got to adjust their expectations as well. Because they always come with you and say, oh, I've got I've got mold illness. Look at my mycotoxin test. And then you take a two-hour history and they've got 50 other determinants of being unwell. Right. So then you give them the diagnostic roadmap to give them the, what you believe, I believe, is the insight into that. But then they aren't, you know, they aren't, so they don't have funding. So then you try and work with what you can, but you've got to taper your expectation and they've got to taper theirs. And that's a tricky relationship with people, you know, particularly if they've been traumatized because if they don't trust what you're saying, they're going to project all their distrust onto you. And then they're right. going to, you know, they're going to get tricky. It's a tricky relationship working with ill people. Not always, but it can be. Yes. Yes. So let's, let's talk about an example of SIR, somebody that has the genetic haplotype there, all the blood markers that Dr. Shoemaker brings up, like the MMP9, TGF beta one, MSH, they're all low or they're all high in the I ways that, it. right. So MSH is low. The other markers are extremely high yeah. and their environment isn't the greatest because they don't have the funds to really fix the environment. But then, then I meet people that are limbic system retraining specialists and they talk about how they force their body to rewire their brain and, and be able to get better even in an environment where their army score isn't the best. So, you know, you talked about all these layers of health. Yeah. How do we know that if we were to just pull the layer of trying to manage the brain and how it reacts to stress, like what if that will just heal some of the other areas, even if in test they're off? Tricky, tricky dynamics. <laughs> So if you take the history, there's water exposure. Yes. You do the ERMI testing, that's positive, you know, well, it hurts me too, above 10. Right. And they got all the bad ones. And the, the symptom questionnaire, they've got, you know, 25 symptoms in 13, uh, 12 clusters, and they fail the visual contrast test. And then you do the Shoemaker markers and the TGF beta is 10,000, the C4A is 20,000, MSH is five. <laughs> and the person is highly reactive to the mold that they're exposed to. I don't believe that you can only do DRS or Gupta's retraining program and treat them with that methodology. I think that methodology is important when the amygdala gets sensitized and is hyperreactive to the incoming biotoxins. But I do think you've got to work biologically to downregulate the innate immune system while addressing the amygdala hyperreactivity at the same time. And often you've got to work synergistically. Yes. But there's even a deeper layer that the DNRS and Gupta training program mm. often don't get to the hidden defenses of the individual who's hyperreactive because they're protecting the, the last vestige of their innocence, which never got traumatized. And they are so defended against anything that could be perceived as toxic that they can't downregulate the amygdala because the trust is not there and they can't trust anything. And that's when you need to go into internal psychotherapy 
therapeutic work. Uh, and you can't just work with dynamic neural retraining or Gupta program. You have to address the defenses of the individual. And so it's tricky, but it can be negotiated. And some of my patients with amygdala sensitivity, they just think of mold and they react. They yeah. do. It's a real reaction. It's not, they're just so sensitive that. And you look at the neuroquad and the amygdala is in the 98th percentile. It's hypertrophy. It's big. It's wow. two standard deviations than everybody and then their colleagues in the uh, age match controls. So then yeah. you've got to you've got to do all sorts of neurobiof, all the whole things around neuroplasticity and you know, cell membrane integrity and fatty acid manipulation and so it's complex that's it interesting be because that's kind of what i'm coming down to so just to give you a background i specialize in the carnivore diet because i believe it's the ultimate elimination diet in terms of just getting food off the table as a culprit of your illness and then we can work on everything else and so there's a handful of people including myself that have healed a lot in terms of illness, mental illness through a meat only diet. But as I worked with more people and more complicated cases that the food doesn't fix everything. So they get a lot better, but not enough that they feel better. And so they start working with me and I started noticing there were people that had this SIRS and I fell into shoemaker's work. We started testing some of the markers and they had the genetic type. They had all the markers we just mentioned. And, and so they started some of the cholestyramine, they did some of the excess fish oils, and it wasn't enough. And my guess is, like you mentioned that um, Kennedy test, they would have probably had really low markers. And do not touch cholestyramine unless you know the lipid content. It's a yes. fatal mistake. Second fatal mistake. First is treating a person with, with a mycotoxin test as having mold illness. Second is throwing cholestyramine at them prematurely. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so, well, that say. test is not part of the nat the original protocol. And no, so no, I, no. I, I actually learned it from you. And it yeah. made so much sense of, well, this is a bile acid reducer, which also was known to reduce your cholesterol. And if you cannot take in fatty acids, you might not have the wherewithal to even take the cholestyramine. And so the the phospholipid flush the and the fatty acids that all made sense but then and cholesterol also- cholesterol forms a structure in your cell membrane and is a precursor to all your hormones you don't want to block cholesterol to the point of extinction you want the cholesterol to be sort of highish normal not you know, yes yes yeah, you don't and, want to block I, cholesterol and i think that's where carnivore is so powerful that if somebody has been eating carnivore with a high fat diet and their cholesterol markers are high they're more prepared to take cholestyramine than yes. the average person that's yes. eating a low fat diet exactly don't get me started on the vegan diet and i'm going to get everybody to kind of scream at me on social no, media no. well my community is not plant based um i actually got sick on a plant based diet so yeah, but i was i was the head of the vegetarian society for 17 years so I'm oh, familiar yeah. with it, okay. but in my experience, you don't get people well on a vegan diet if they're in a chronic ill health, multi-system, multi-symptom, complex illness mode. It's just not going to happen. Right, right. And I, and I fully agree with that. And so what happened was some of the people, as they got diagnosed with SIRS, they started going into the excess research of what do I need to do now? I need to be super mindful of every building I go into. And you know, that fight or flight mode, just really high gear of stress and um, just being in their illness all day long. And I think those people then using the, the limbic system retraining. So it seems like it's a lot of these modalities together that can actually heal people more than them together. Yes. Most of those people, and I say this generically and somewhat, I hope it doesn't come off as sort of prejudicial, but a lot of those people with the limbic hyperreactivity or have trauma oh no i believe that too and they can't there's no there's no res, they, they can't self-regulate there's no window of tolerance and i send them to somatic experiencing trauma therapists i don't they do gupta and dnrs but they often need to do body-based body up therapy where they need to actually learn how to tolerate more and develop a window of tolerance um, uh, that I use SE practitioners a lot, somatic oh, okay. experience. I refer to them. I'll have to look into that. That's fascinating. Yeah, just check that one out because it's uh, it's a it's the game changer. Yeah, when DNRS fails and Gupta fails, think trauma, think early, think SE uh, body body based. You know, Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's real stuff, you know. Okay. And it's, okay. if you look at Robert Naveau's cell danger response, you look at Paul Jesus' polyvagal, uh, dorsal vagal shutdown response, those people are often 
autonomic nervous system shut down, mitochondria are shut down, they're in an inflammatory response. So is this part of uh, Robert Naveau's cell danger response number one. Okay, that makes sense. And they shut down and they don't have a capacity to self-regulate. It's not happening because they, they, their whole system is in a state of freeze, not fight, flight. That's, you know, they in beyond that. Yes, they're yes. beyond that. Yeah. And they and, and SE practitioners know that stuff backwards and they can okay. help you negotiate that territory. Yeah. And Paul Jez developed the safe and sound protocol, which is a series of uh, okay. sounds and music. And patients with severe trauma who do self and sound, this is the feedback I've got. It found like, it sounded like my mother's soothing voice mm. had finally spoken and got through to me. Wow. <laughs> There's that, that what does the mother's soothing voice do to a child? The child entrains with the mother's voice and tone. The right prefrontal cortex of the mother resonates with the child's right prefrontal mm. cortex. They entrain with each other over 30 years. Mm. The child looks away, looks away, self-regulates, looks to the mother. Mother's still there. Mother still loves me, challenged me a bit, you know, support challenge. Over 30 years of neurodevelopment, the child learns to trust the environment, learns to trust safety, learns limbic resonance. They learn to right. self-regulate their system. If there's been early trauma, it doesn't work. Self the sense of self doesn't develop. The sense of self trust and self regulation isn't there. Safe and sound recreates that which is missing. The mother's voice, That's the powerful. glint, in, the glint in the mother's eye. Mother just has to have be thirty percent present apparently to have a, a reasonable child upbringing. Oh wow! <laughs> you don't okay. have to be a perfect mother. You just got to be present about thirty percent of the time, and you got to support and challenge that child and give it appropriate sort of boundaries to work in and and create a sense of trust and safety. So would you recommend then for a lot of the people that are dealing with chronic illness, chronic fatigue, let's say they don't have a lot of funds, but some of that trauma work and um, the somatic, as you were talking about doing that can be very beneficial with in tandem with someone like yourself that can also support and pr provide care. It's so difficult here, Judy. I'm so used to working with a very broad diagnostic math Okay. That I, I can say yes, but and, you know, yes, what else is going on? Right. Is the theta brainwave three standard deviations higher than the peer group? And if so, that person doesn't do well. They're in a dissociated mm -hmm. in, in capillopathy. Okay. So they may not be able to do safe and sound work, you know? Okay. Yeah. yeah I know yeah. there's always nuance and I, I totally understand that fully. I wanted to shift topics a little bit. I know mm -hmm. that you, on your Instagram page, you share a lot about MCAS histamine responses. Yeah, yeah. Can you share a little bit about in the carnivore community, for example, a lot of people will remove certain foods and then they try to reintroduce it. It could even be salmon, for example. And they say that they have more mast cell activation and more histamine responses eating the carnivore way. I don't know if it's because part of the reason is that they removed the food for a while. And now as they're introducing it, they're just uh, um, reacting and maybe it just well, takes a little bit of reintroduction, but what are your thoughts? Well, histamine, you know, is a breakdown product of histidine, right? Right. Which and is there's an more amino acid. And where's histidine found more in salmon, right? So, you know, um, if they've got mast cell activation and I, you know, if you go and do an ion panel, you'll see histidine there. Oh, okay. And all my mast cell patients have high histidine levels. Mm. You see it all the time. And so if you're introducing salmon in particular, if it's not flash frozen on the boat, sure, sure. aged, what are the worst triggers of mast cell? Mm. That and eggs, you know, and all the fermented foods that are so popular now. I know. So, so you've got to be careful with that one. You've got to, be, you know. Beef, if it's, you know, a lot of beef is old too. They let right. it, they, let it, they age it. They it. Yeah, they age it. And so, of course, you know, that's a sitting duck for my cell activation. But that's where you've got to do the precision Dunwoody mm -hmm. test and see what the DAO is doing mm -hmm. and see what the histamine levels and the zonulin levels. And then really prepare them, you know, use your umbrellix or your his DAO in huge amounts. 30 minutes along with chromalin, you know, if you suspect you're going to react to meat or, or any food for that matter. And then you use all your mast cell. I'm very aggressive with mast cell blockers. I use them. Okay. I use pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals, but I, I, I happen to use pharmaceuticals more than nutraceuticals because I find they get the job done quicker and patient. I do intravenous mast cell blockade for the mm. very sensitive people, the ones who are just wiped out. They can't function. They can't leave their house because they're reactive. They're down to three foods. Right. So we, we bring them in 
look for POTS first, look for hypermobility number two, then treat them with intravenous mast cell, Benadryl, Toradol, Ativan. We use IV Ativan, which is a mast cell blocker, on Dancitron for some of the nausea and GI symptoms. Get them stabilized, then onto pharmaceuticals, then maybe nutraceuticals. I work that way around. I know lots of people work nutraceutically, but I, I just, because I'm an MD, I, you know. but you've got to use them without excipients or dyes. You've got to get compounded pharmaceuticals. Sure. So what is the root cause of this MCAS, right? So it's obviously there's a hypersensitivity to histamines. Not everyone has that same reaction. I mean, some of it is maybe they have gut permeability, but something triggered the MCAS to occur. Like what is the root cause of why are people getting diagnosed with MCAS? And it, sometimes it just happens in their 30s and 40s, but what is causing it? And so Afrin, Lawrence Afrin, who I work with, and okay. I'm part of his little group. We wrote, he wrote the paper, which we co-authored on the consensus two statement of what is mast cell activation, how to diagnose it. There are genetics to it. It's mm-hmm. not the same genetics that are there with systemic mastocytosis. So mast cell activation syndrome is just an overactivity of mast cells. Systemic mastocytosis, as you know, is increased numbers of mast cells. Mm-hmm. So in, in, in mast cell activation syndrome, you've got twitchy mast cells and mast cells sit in all the surfaces of the body to protect you from incoming toxic load and internal mental stresses. Lawrence Afflin believes that the mental uh, trigger of mast cell activation is more powerful than the physiological triggers. So what you have is, you know, these vigilante cells sitting there ready to pounce whenever something comes in that shouldn't be coming in and they send out thousand mediators of inflammation of which we measure 10 Mm -hmm. histamine is one of them and histamine yeah so you've got these mast cells sitting on all the orifices in your nose um your gi tract particularly richly innervated in the duodenum all the way through to the anus in the skin in the brain in the cardiac tissue and lungs in particular and they send out a thousand mediators of inflammation histamine being one of them right one out of a thousand and they send out these, in, these signalings to try and dampen the incoming toxic load. So they're protected, but they're overreactive. Why? Because look around you. We're inundated all day long with you know, toxins or triggers, biotoxins, chemicals, metals, insecticides, pesticides, EMFs. Oh my, don't let me start on the EMF story. Terrible trigger of mast cell activation in a subset of patients, those with electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome. Just to, for your, for your um, clients, don't work without a building biologist looking at the EMF exposures of your patients. Mm-hmm. Ask them about it. The same is don't work without a biological dentist looking at the bite and the root canals and the cavitations and the metals and the alloys and everything else. So the reason why the mast cells are so active is because our toxic load is so active. It's so huge. And so you get, there's a genetic predisposition to some people for my cell activation syndrome, mm-hmm. but it's a toxic load that's exceeded our capacity to self-regulate once again. And so they're just throwing out, you know, armor, trying to, trying to keep the lid on a, a massive inflammatory response. But they trigger, my cells trigger oxidative stress. They trigger peroxynitrate. What does peroxynitrate do? It rips through your outer membrane and your inner cell membrane, phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethylamine, gets to your DNA, your mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA unravels, goes outside the cell with ATP. Wow. Outside the cell, they become pro-inflammatory, and they then they call purines. They then trigger mast cell activation to trigger peroxynitrate, and all of a sudden, you're stuck in an inflammatory response you can't get out of. So that's the cell danger response, which is so beautifully described by Robert okay. Laveau. Yeah. Again, for your audience, please don't go far without knowing his work backwards and forwards. Yeah. Sure. And I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. So then do you think if people get out of the toxic soup and they change their environment, work on some of the trauma, you know, and I'm saying it so simply, I know it's not that simple, mm-hmm. but that we can actually reverse some of the MCAS so that our bodies are not reacting oh. as much. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I've had people, you know, they do the MSQ symptom questionnaire, which is the IFM standard questionnaire for toxicity all the symptoms score 180 190 from add up all their symptoms normals 20 or less they come in a year later their scores down at 20 
Yeah, no, people get better. Now, the ones who don't get better are the highly traumatized individuals who have personality disorders. They are trickier to work with, you know, borderlines and, and people with severe mental health issues like anxiety, sure. OCD. OCD is a big one. Yeah. Mm. They often don't get better until they use an SSRI or some form of control of the uh, hyperactivity of the system. How much do you think diet plays a role out of curiosity? 100%, but it's not the only thing. Diet is everything. Of course. Diet in general, 100%. Diet with MCAS, 99%. It's big. You know, it's big. Now, Lawrence Afrin doesn't believe diet is as big as some of us do in the functional world. But those of us who work in the functional world, I mean, there's no way you're going to treat a severe mast cell person who's eating eggs and drinking kombucha and you know drinking wine every night it's not going to happen there's no way so you have them on lower histamine foods then i work with justine stenger a nutritionist chef we've written a cookbook together and we do paleo autoimmune mm. low histamine ketogenic maybe fodmaps maybe salicylates maybe oxalates we do we have to know all the diets Yes. And that makes and sense. We and know, we have to know how to juggle them. And we've developed a two page cheat sheet with every food color coded. So, you know, onions, it's got a color code for oxalates or salicylates or FODMAS. So a food may have four colors on it because it's got four different potential sure. effects on the body. And to try and work that out, you've got to look at your food testing. You've got to take your history because the food testing doesn't tell you about Marcel necessarily, right. but right. you'll see trends showing up quite a lot. You'll see pineapples in there, kiwis in there, candidas in there. Mm. A lot of the beans are in there. A lot of the beans are always in there. It's fascinating. Uh, yeah. And so you just look at trends and you try to think it through and you look at their diet and, and you eventually work out what to do. But I think the mildly ketogenic paleo autoimmune low histamine is where uh, we sort of trend towards to restore the cell membrane integrity and repair mitochondria. Yeah. And that's where I love the carnivore diet. I mean, obviously I have my biases, but so I know that there are foods in the carnivore diet that are high histamine, but if you were to remove those, so let's say the eggs, let's say some of the fish, but if you were to focus on mostly meat based, and then, um, I mean, it's so similar to the paleo. It's just, I think, I, I forget if the autoimmune paleo contains nuts. I don't think it does, but maybe it does. Um, well, you take out all nuts in the paleo. Or okay, okay. I, I include three uh, three of the non-histaminic nuts sometimes, just in the beginning. Brazil nut, pine nut, and I always forget the third one. Is There's it macadamia? Nuts that, uh, macadamia. Okay, okay. There's three nuts that aren't histaminic. Okay, how funny. So if that. people are really have got no foods, we always use those to begin with, and then we see, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. So you do it like a trickle-down effect. Okay, does that make sense? But I take out all grains, all legumes, all nightshades, all dairy, all fermented foods, all alcohol, all, uh, you know, we take them out. Right. We start from scratch. Meat, fish, chicken, stir fries, salads with oils and fats. The oils and the fats are the piece that people do not do properly. I agree. And and that's why if you stick to mostly carnivore, you're not eating seed oil. So then it becomes so, so much, I know it's a lot more restrictive than at least giving them the, those three nuts. But in general, if you do a meat only, it becomes easier because it's really easy to figure out which ones um, you just focus on meats and then you're not eating seed oil. So you're just sticking to the lard or the, um, the suet and other types of fat. And, and then you may they just have to have a list of what foods in the animal based world that are higher in histamines. And you may just have to reduce those. And it becomes a lot more simple when these people are trying to do so many different things. And that's where I personally like the carnivore diet, um, especially as an elimination diet first. And then as they heal, they can introduce other foods. So I think, I think it makes a lot of sense. There's another player on the, on the market these days is uh, good hours work with plasmologens. Okay. And he does a test called the prodrome scan where he measures all the, all the, plasmologens and dha and oh, okay phosphatidyl codeine so I'll, now i'm learning to work with that test the um kennedy krieger fatty acid and the igl mitochondria and our all our work is to repair cell membranes mm -hmm. and to work with the right fats to re, to uh improve um, neuronal tissue, uh, white matter, and to create an anti-inflammatory effect through DHA and so forth and so on. But majority of people that come and see me are omega-6 depleted. Mm. They all, they, none of them are doing all uh, vegetable-based oils, and all of them are on fish oil. And oh, their fish oil is completely, 
It's completely suppressed the omega-6 side. And the omega-6 side, the linoleic acid, is the raw material for phosphatidylcholine. That's so fascinating. So a lot of people in my community are so scared of omega-6s because of the linoleic acid that's causing no, no, obesity. No, 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 no. So no, can no. you explain a little bit? So these people are have been on a diet and they're they've they're now becoming deficient in omega-6. Omega-6s, linoleic, gamma linoleic, yes. arachidonic, it's all wiped out. They minus. Minus 100 on the omega-6 profile on the Kennedy Krieger test. And that's the precursors to a lot of your phosphatidylcholine, which is the major fat that's made from methylation that helps run outer and inner cell membranes. Go figure. And so and the reason why they don't use the vegetable oils is because most of them are toxic and, and they're rancid and they've got deodorizers in them. Yes. They hide the smell of the rancid. Body bio's <laughs> phosphatidylcholine, I think is, you know, uh, is a fantastic omega-6 precursor if you're deficient in it. I would take the body bio a balanced oil, which is a balanced. Staff oh, okay, paper. okay. I'm aware of that one. Yes. Yeah, and and it's 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 prepared in a very clean, you know, cold pressed. Uh, from oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, very clean, no oxidation. And if you lower in a lake, that's what we plug in. Mm. Um, Justine Stenger, again, the nutritionist I work with, she she consults on the plasmologen, the pl prodrome, and the body bio fatty acid, and works people together with those nutritionally and supplementally. Yeah. It's, it's amazing that we hear certain context of certain nutrition and wellness, and then people take it to a limp, to an extreme, and then they become deficient in omega sixes. And, and I started seeing that a little bit in my, um, I, I do a basic omega three, six test, and people were starting to get more omega three rich because they were afraid of the omega sixes. And now people are starting to get deficient because of all the polyunsaturated fatty acids that can cause obesity or insulin resistance. And also because of the fear of these seed oils. And, and now we're becoming super more, it's either that we don't have any fats or that we're becoming more omega three rich and we're becoming deficient. And I didn't even think about the phosphatidylcholine. And that makes sense because I do recommend phosphatidylcholine but without thinking about the omega-6 and the precursor. Omega-6 of the omega, the little lake is the, you know, phosphatidylcholine is often made from saturated, they can be made from saturated fats, but can also, little lake is one of the major contributors towards phosphatidylcholine. Right. And so is the methylation panel, the folic acid, B12, mm -hmm. zinc, magnesium, ATP, that whole, uh, SAMe, that whole methylation panel, 70% of methylation and methyl transfer is all to do with making phosphatidylcholine. I have phosphatidylcholine is rules. You know? Right, right. And creatine. I mean, the, the methylation mm -hmm. cycle is big on creatine too. So, you know, one marker in the SIRS protocol is that our MSH is low and the goal is to increase that MSH so that our brain is not atrophying. And, you know, a lot of the protocol says that the way that you increase MSH is eventually you go through the whole shoemaker protocol, yeah. but you take VIP. Yeah. But when I was doing some re research, the pituitary is what produces the um, MSH or melanocyte stimulating hormone, and some of it gets activated by UV rays. So couldn't we, some of us go outside every day and get more UV rays and maybe it's not enough, but could it actually increase some of the MSH? I don't know the answer to that. I do know looking, you know, at the sunrise and sunset has a tremendous effect on pituitary function, okay. melatonin production. Yeah. But yeah. with MSH being low, most people with SIRS have low MSH, like sometimes super low. Right. And and you've got it, all the up, upstream, you know, inflammatory cytokines have to be down regulated. And then you've got to look for Marcons because the, you know, the nasal staph is what suppresses the MSH. Right. So you've got to treat the Marcons first. But treat the Marcons, down regulate all the up, you know, all the steps, get them out of the toxic thing, uh, toxic building. And some people are now using peptides. Mm. Yeah, to help treat the MSH. Oh, mel melanotan, yeah, peptide. Mm. But again, that you see, that's an N squared, D squared thought process. Yes, yes. Name, name of medicine, name of symptom, name of drug. Yes, that's true. It's not like that. You've got to look systemically. How do I remove everything that's suppressing MSH? Right. Mm. And then how does MSH naturally start to find its way back up? Yeah. In your patients, do you ever see them fully heal and their markers all normalize? 
over time if they follow oh, the oh, no absolutely oh yes oh yes oh yeah and and white matter lesions in the brain disappear how much do you think the environment needs to be pristine because that's the biggest thing i get the hang up is it's nearly impossible to have an environment that has zero mold so it depends on the level of amygdala sensitization mm. to that patient and the level of trauma and the level of trust it's this algorithmically complex so some people who have they are say HLA positive, but they've got good ego strength and have resilience. They can tolerate a lot more mm. than somebody who's, you know, in Ayurvedic terms, vata imbalanced, sure. fatty acid deficient, sympathetic dominance or in polyvagal shutdown. They can't tolerate a lot. And so they just look at our building. And if they just catch a whiff of a, of a musty smell, they are in a full, you know, Flare. surge yeah. reaction. Yeah. It's so individual. You never know. That's so fascinating. And that makes a lot of sense when I think about my individual clients, how certain people are a lot more resilient, even though they have the haplotype and then yeah. other ones, just the fact that they have a split second where they feel finally, I have an answer, but then the split second later is, oh no, I have this haplotype and then they start reacting. So yeah. it is interesting well, because you see, sirs, you can often not be exposed to mold, but sirs in and of itself is the disease that you now have. Right. You have a chronically active innate immune system that is now your problem. Yes. And you may not be living in a moldy environment, but you haven't gone through the steps of reduction of the, of the biotoxin that originally was there that triggered the whole SERS response in the first place. Right, right. And that's what Naveau called the cell danger response. You're mm -hmm. stuck in the cell danger response. And Robert Naveau brilliantly said, we need things, he called the word salugenesis. You need to input therapeutic signaling to change the, the cell danger response. You can't just hope to get better one day. You've actually got to do things, you know. What are some of the examples that he, um, that Robert Naveau recommends to improve the cell danger response? Well, he's a researcher and he used the okay. drug serumin, which is a, uh, an old drug that you can't get. Oh, okay. uh, Ceramin blocked the, the receptors for the um, DNA fragments and ATP fragments for triggering this whole cell danger response. Oh, okay. Okay. But okay. he also did all the work on what are the biological changes and the cell danger response. And what is the one that is most consistent? Phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine is big. That is so crazy because I do, I have been adding that before people even consider cholestyramine. So maybe do some of the omega threes and I, I did see that balance of the omega-6, 3-6, and I wasn't sure if I was going to use that one. But And then I thought of the phosphatidylcholine for the membranes, but it's so fascinating. I'll, I'll definitely have to look more into his research. Many people overdo the DHA component of omega-3s yes. or the EPA. Now the, I don't, this is Dr. Goodenow's research. I'm not sort of up on it as much as I should be. Okay. But I do know that alpha-linolenic acid and EPA uh, signaling molecules and they don't do much for the whole equation. It's the DHA that does everything. Okay. So he has a plasmologen, DHA specific plasmologen, but you can overdose on DHA as well. Right. So everybody who comes in with this omega, you know, three, six index that's off the chart for omega six, they're in danger of being very deficient in some of the essential fats to regulate cell membrane and mitochondrial functioning. So I wouldn't go off those simple tests. I would, I would look at Kennedy Krieger or the uh, fatty acid test. Okay. No, no, even, the I, even the ion panel fatty acid test is not robust enough. Sometimes it even contradicts the Kennedy Krieger one. That's fascinating. Okay. Okay. No, good to know. A question about the ERMI test. So um, I had a client that took a, you know, like a, I think it's just a air sample from a person that normally, you know, sells homes and they do the mold testing. And then I told him that he should, and his, so his house came out clean and then he did the army test and his number was maybe in the twenties. And I told him that you have high mold and that the other test is not really accurate. The first mold inspector came back and showed a link to the EPA saying that army tests are not supposed to be used. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts of the testing? So the answer to that question you know, the one you, the person you want to read who's done so much work is Richie Shoemaker. He's okay. really dissected this issue backwards and forwards. Okay. And he did a series of uh, articles in the Townsend Letter, which you just Google it, one to five on mold. And he discusses that question in detail. 
Okay. And so the World Health Organization has come out saying that the air sampling test is irrelevant. Mm. Uh, it's worthless and meaningless because A, you've got to circulate air through, first of all, a lot of the toxins aren't in the air, they're on the ground. Secondly, the particulate size of the, of the, the spores or the mycotoxins are lower than 0.3 microns and they pass through the, they pass uh. through the device. You don't pick them up. And so, and, and thirdly, like stachybotrys, the most damaging of all of them is on the floor. It's not in the air. There's this whole, in the shoemaker group anyway, this whole sort of, they don't, they don't use air sampling. It's not used. They, right. you see, and he says, do not even, somebody comes at you with an air sampler, throw them out your house. But it's the industry standard. I know. That's and the what's... litigating lawyers and the insurance companies, that's what they use. So, but... and the ERMI test was not supposed to be used clinically. But I can tell you now, the ERMI and HERSME2 test with the added actinomyces and other components, that's what I don't even look at as something. I just wanted to clarify for the audience. I mean, there are people, that's what we're known for is the air sampling. But if yeah. you have anyone that's struggling with mold illness, they recommend the ERMI and the ERTSME. So I... Well, the ERTSME2 and looking at the aspergillus fasciculum. And the other thing is it doesn't differentiate the, the aspergillus species. Mm. You don't know if it's fasciculum or penistyloides. It doesn't look for Wolevia. It's, it's not good. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. There are some people that struggle with Lyme and uh, Lyme is, they say it's really, really hard to detect that it's really hard to figure out the co-infections. People will do the Western blot and it doesn't always uh, show that you have it. There's like the other, the galaxy and I forget the Igenix one, I think, but do you recommend a certain test that people can figure out if they have Lyme? No. And I, and I, it's just such a, Again, I mean, I, I think I, one word that's coming out of my mouth repeatedly, it's complex. And I hate to say that, but it's complex. I know. <laughs> You've got to get a history from the patient. Okay. Not necessarily the tick bite and the, you know, the, the erythema rash and the week followed by a flu-like illness. If you get that history, okay, that's great. But many people don't have that history, you know. Okay, yes. And so you've got to do a history. Then I do, I do questionnaires. I do the MSITS questionnaire by Horowitz, mm. and I do the Can Lyme questionnaire revised, which is from the Canadian Lyme Association, canlyme.com or .org or something. And then I added Boris Garner's questionnaire, and I made my own. Okay. So I do Horowitz's, my own. I take a history, and if I'm suspecting tick-borne infection and co-infection, I then run T-cell testing or through Armin Labs in Germany, and I run IgNX, full IgNX immunoblot testing. And if I suspect, and I'm looking there for IgM, IgG, PCR, um, and I'm looking for RNA fragmentation, and I'm looking for all the added Lyme biomarkers that have recently come up with relapsing fever and Miyamoto oh, and things sure. like that. So I do all of those IgNX wise, Armin Lab. Ellie spots, I don't do the Tickplex Plus much with Armin because I get what I need from the um, IgenX. And then I run Galaxy Labs for okay. Bitomella. And then I sit with the awareness that many people will have negative labs and still have tick-borne illness. And that's the sort of current teaching amongst one of the all the pioneers mm. in Lyme world, which is vilified by the uh, ISDA Association. There's no such thing as chronic Lyme. Right. The you know, the testing's irrelevant. It's a, it's a mess. It's a minefield. And what I do know is that many people come in with a, you know, an IgG, IgenX Lyme test that's on one of the bands and say, I got Lyme. It's like coming with the mycotoxin test and say, I got SIRS. Right. That's a perilous uh, mistake okay. to make. Okay. You've got to really, you've got to have your wits about you from a num for a number of reasons. A, if you... The diagnostic testing is expensive. Yes. B, patients love to find single point causation. If they say you've got Lyme, you're going to send them down a rabbit hole of two to four years of whatever treatment you choose. Sure. And C, you are going to be vilified by your traditional colleagues if you're not sure-footed on this one. Mm. And most of our medical boards will take your license away. Wow. If you, oh, yeah. If you start dabbling in this field. So it depends on your resilience to withstand the whole onslaught of the Lyme world. Now, there's people out there who do Lyme beautifully. 
and who are experts like Horowitz and Steve Harris and others, you know. Mm -hmm. And I recommend you probably go to the, the most prominent, most qualified, loud, you know, most outspoken expert in the field and go to treat it by them. But to be treated by an inexperienced naturopath or right. who's been to one ILADS course and has one test, I, be careful. Yeah. It's a perilous path. Um, okay. Yeah. As we're closing, if people are, you know, have tried many different diets and they're just not getting fully better and, you know, standard care has really not been doing good for them and diet helps somewhat, but not enough. And they're just feeling chronic fatigue. Where, where should they start? And like, what should they do to maybe incrementally start getting better? Should they save up money to work with somebody? I mean, what are your thoughts? So a person who's change their diet, but still chronically fatigued? Yeah, I guess mostly fatigue. Maybe they're still struggling with hypothyroid. And they're, I guess, maybe we don't take talk about the hypothyroid, because maybe they have to balance their medication, but somebody that's just still not fully feeling well, and I guess the main symptoms would be chronic fatigue, maybe some brain fog, but just generally unwell. Julia, I hate to sort of be the bearer of bad news, but you got to do all layers, all levels. You got to take a history. It's fair. You know, if so, so let's look at one of the variables. Yeah, a person may be uninspired. They're living a life. They're not living their value system. They're living their fathers, and they're having to get up and go to work every day, not inspired and not being called from above, if you will, by that which is speaks to them and evokes their creative spirit. Yes, and but they got a positive mycotoxin and a mold or whatever test you want. <laughs> and then you start taking the history and you realize, you know, is this person, what do they have to get up to every day? What, what is, what calls it? I get up every day and do what I do because I love to do what I do. What's calling them from above to get up and do what they love to do. Why? Because the reticular activating system in the brain is designed to shut you down when you're not doing what you're inspired to do. Mm. So their fatigue may be just the fact that they're not living their value system. They're living their fathers. Or they don't even know what their value system is. They don't even know who they are. They've got no self-insight. They're not inside. They don't know why they get up every day. They've got nothing that calls them from above. So yeah, you can go and do the mold and the diet, but they have no reason to get up every morning. And there's a lot of patients like that, you know? And you have to start appealing to that aspect of them. Look at their value system and see what's inspired them. And some of them, you know, patients... How many patients have you had? Chronic fatigue, sick, unwell. You work beautifully for two years. You go through every single test in the book. You do everything right, no better. And then you go and you find out they go away. And a year later, they come back and they're fine. What happened to you? I left my husband. I left my job and I fell in love. How, much of, how many of us work in that? You know, we ask about that, but you don't know until the person has changed some of their experiences as to what role those played in their life. You may have hinted it, sure. but until they, they get insight, until they change some of their determinants, healing is, must, we know so little, you know, we know so little. Uh, and sometimes it takes, sometimes it takes, if you will, an act of God. It takes, I don't mean that in a religious sense, but there's some movement that sort of enters their field that pulls them into a new experience and all of a sudden they shift and their biochemistry shifts and the molecular signaling shifts and they, they they feel inspired and life's meaningful again i don't know the answer to that question no I, I think that's good i mean for me i struggled with mental health and depression anxiety i didn't like my job it was a very well-paying job i traveled the world everyone loved the kind of work i did in that sense but at the core of me, I hated what I was doing. It wasn't fun. I didn't enjoy it. Um, and, and I s struggled with depression. And so I changed the diet and that helped me a lot, but it was really oh. when I then found my purpose and, yeah. um, and God had something to do with it too. Yeah. And all of that together has healed me a lot. So now I no longer share that it's just the diet because the diet helped me a lot. But it was like you said, it's all the layers and I will always have something to work on in that whole sphere of things that you mentioned. But I think acknowledging that because a lot of my clients will say, I have stress. It's um, that's normal. This is just the life we live in nowadays. But I think it's making us more sick than we realize. 
Yeah, there's a term in the integrative field called the allostatic load, you know, yes. the incoming load versus the resilience. And often that's, you know, and people, are, often people are so habituated to living in the world in a certain way, they don't know any other way. And so they think that's their norm. Right. But then they go on holiday, they fall in love, they have another experience, and all of a sudden they go, that wasn't harmonious or coherent with my values. Now I can see, and only in retrospect can they look back and see. Or they leave a difficult relationship, you know. Sometimes people, through Myers-Briggs typology or through attachment styles or Ayurvedic styles, they just oil and water. Mm -hmm. But they try out of the goodness of their heart to make it work. And it's, but it's the allostatic load of that relationship is push them out of homeostasis. Mm -hmm. And then something happens and that relationship breaks up. And all of a sudden the life force gets released and the patient's back on track. But they, was, they were just pushing against that allostatic load that they weren't conscious of until they somehow they got out of it through an act of God or whatever. And they're now out and they look back and they go, oh my goodness, how did I persevere for so long? It's a lot to think about. And I love, I love it because I've just found so many of my clients that this is the way to heal is they have to touch everything in their life and it's not easy. And people want the magic pill to fix everything, whether it's the diet, a supplement, a medication, a test. But I think from our conversation, it's probably a difficult one to listen to because it's not that simple. But if people really want to get to a level of healing that they can reach, um, it's really looking into a lot of these layers that you so eloquently have brought up. So thank you for that. Yeah, layers, layers and levels. Yeah. In the, in the roadmap thingy that I do here, which I haven't published yet because I, it's in my book, but it's, you know, each level is experience and anatomical conceptual mm -hmm. designation as related science, a diagnostic method and the treatment method. So at all layers, there's just, there's, sort of a template of possibilities and many people go to the wrong level you know they go they go and see an acupuncturist when they should be seeing an oncologist mm. or they go and see a shaman when they should be going to see a chiropractor so there's different layers and different levels so try and educate as to what layer what level when and how to integrate all the possibilities well, thank you so much for your time. If so, I know you're in Canada. And so this was my struggle is I always need to find a source practitioner to work with my people that have the markers that need to start going through this journey. But you're in Canada. So one, how does that work with insurance? If people are in America, is your clinic open for new patients? So I, I do see new patients, but with the US patients, I act as an educator and guide and advocate because we, you know, we can't sort of practice across state lines, so to speak. So I can suggest and guide, uh, but they have to have a primary care provider that will implement suggestions and uh, advice. And then do you um, normally have somebody in the States that you recommend? I recommend people go to the ICI website, I-S-E-A-I, -E and find a practitioner in the area that uh, has the most experience. Yeah. And so where can people find you, your clinic? Um, in Calgary, Alberta, and um, I have a website that's got a lot of my blogs where I write about all these things, and that's the HoffmanCenter.com. Center is T-R-E, not the American E-R. <laughs> and then I think my staff may have sent you my Instagram thingy. And yes, I'll I'll put it in the show notes. I know, yeah. I know you're busy. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. I, I understand. I, I have read several of your blogs and you are so well-versed and comprehensive. And I, I was totally drawn to you because of that. So thank you for all your work. No pleasure. I'm glad you uh, were able to make use of some of the late night research. Yes, no, I get that. Trust me. Um, so <laughs> I will put all your information in the show notes. I'm excited to just see people really take a look at their illness and um, take it to another level and look at the different layers. And I would, I'd like to say thank you to all the, you know, this saying that's a cliche, but the standing on the shoulders of others, but Dietrich Klinghardt, Neil Nathan, Richie Shoemaker, Larry Darcy, Deepak, all of these people that, you know, you just, you make your way in relationship to all that they've done before you. So we're not isolated in that way. And uh, it's good to say thank you to all your teachers and you know, gratitude for what we can pass on and integrate and make new, you know, constantly reinventing the diagnostic and therapeutic uh, platform. You know. Yes, the goal is always the people and trying to get people better. And if we can fine tune someone's work, that's absolutely the goal is because we want people to heal.
So yeah, and and and, and advice. Uh, to stay related to your patients, you know, through limbic resonance, just, you know, the masks had done away with that, you know, but the eyes, the tone of voice, the, the connection, uh, that's where trust gets established. And that's the, the hidden alchemy of healing, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. I love it. I believe it. Well, thank <laughs> okay. you so much. All right. Thank okay. you, Julie. Now it's starting to you. Okay, guys, I know that this interview is not the most rainbows and unicorns in terms of healing. It may be a long journey, but always have hope that you can heal. Sometimes it takes a lot more extra work than the average person that may eat a meat only elimination diet, but you can still heal. And there's a lot that you can do, even with all the nuances and depends. And it's complex from Dr. Hoffman. He says that diet is a hundred percent part of the equation. Carnivore is a perfect diet to do while you're trying to heal all these other levels and modalities in your life that you need to focus on. It's never really about the carbs. It's never really about the PUFAs. It's never really about those other things. Oftentimes the illness is far deeper than that. In our conversation, one thing that was really fascinating was that Dr. Hoffman brings up how a lot of his patients, after having learned a lot about the damaging seed oils and the toxins in canola oil and soybean oil are now actually showing up that they're really deficient in omega-6s. He talks about how we need some of these essential omega-6, such as linoleic acid and the other omega-6s to even produce phosphatidylcholine. We may be hurting ourselves by trying to reduce our omega-6 to the point of illness. It's just something to consider. I know there's a lot of advocates that are so against omega-6 to the point that we are just focusing on omega-3s, but it is in balance and we are required for both for optimal health. It's just something to consider if you are removing all levels of omega-6 in your diet. I hope that this conversation really makes you think and figure out what you need to do to help you get to root cause healing. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.